Um, so here's a question for all y'all to start thinking about. How loud is loud enough? Or how loud is too loud? When you're talking about delivery, that's a whole different subject. That's what we're going to talk about today. When loud is not loud, what you need to know about loudness measurement today, and it's a moving target. Um, I'm going to introduce Alex Kosorek, who's going to be our host today. He'll introduce the panel to you. And Alex, if you could hit number three right there, this video will be live. And yes, there awesome. We go. All right, let's have a big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending this afternoon. I really appreciate that you're here in this wonderful space with all the excitement going on. So I thought the first thing which I'll do here is just introduce the people who are going to be eloquently speaking about this wonderful subject. I, I, I like the looks as soon as they say you're eloquent. Setting the bar so high. Yes. So we have Michael Pearson Adams, Director of Education and Training at Waves. Charles Blessing, Chief or CTO at Nugent. <laughs> Charles Van Winkle, Senior Computer Scientist at Adobe. Yes, yes, yes. One of the smart people. And Jonathan Weiner, if you haven't figured out, he's one of the three people who's uh, at, the, at the head of making this entire convention happen. The smartest one here. Yes, perhaps. But he's also a Chief Mastering Engineer at MWorks, Education Director at Isotope, and Professor of uh, at Berkeley College in Boston, so thank you. And there's moi at the bottom, and I think there's been enough said about me, so I'm going to get, it's my choice to get to move on. So, if you go online these days and you just type in the word loudness, and you get all these definitions out there, here are two that are, uh, that at least come up on my Google search right away. One from Miriam Webster, Another one from an Encyclopedia Britannica, which what you see there on the screen is only a small part of the definition. It just goes on for paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. So what I'd like to ask you for is in, when it comes to loudness, especially as a topic here at the convention, what is, what is all the talk about loudness? Just what the heck is it? <laughs> well, the fact that we're all wearing headphones here says something about that immediately, doesn't it? We're surrounded by uh, vibrations, and uh, they're competing with other sounds that you're trying and wanting to hear. So I think um, part of the definition of loudness has to do with the idea of contrast. Uh, you could think of the idea of something being louder than something else. And I think maybe we come up a level and say, everybody, I think it's important to acknowledge when we talk about loudness, loudness is a psychoacoustic phenomenon is something that happens here. Right? It doesn't exist on a meter or in a DAW. It's, it has everything to do with perception. And so when we think about metering and some of the things that we're going to talk about, it's the relationship that we're trying to manage between what's in the box or what's on the output of a device and what actually gets to your brain. So there's the idea of, of contrast, one thing louder than another. There is an, a way in which we are absolutely hardwired for loudness, right? Uh, 120 dB SPL is the definition of the threshold of pain, give or take a little bit. You don't want to go there. Um, and so that's sort of a good starting point. And then there's the frequency distribution and our unequal sensitivity across what we can hear, and that also defines loudness. Um, another word that comes to mind is density in music and persistence. So anyway, that's uh, just a few ideas. I'd love to hear some others. Well, from my point of view, because I'm not nearly as smart as this guy on my right-hand side. Uh, one of the first things I want to bring to the front is the fact that a lot of you, especially the younger people in the audience, may have heard of the term the loudness wars. Right, there's a lot of nodding. So loudness should not be perceived in that way. Um, loudness is a lot closer to what Jonathan just explained. The loudness wars is something we'll probably discuss at some point. But we're way past that. And one of the things, as a youngster in this industry, coming up and learning how to deal with loudness and what is loud and what is too loud, a lot of it, um, a lot of it comes down to bringing everything back to the start of exactly what it is that your premise is, what you're trying to do. What is it that you're mixing? Why are you mixing it? And stop 
don't concentrate so much on the technical side straight away, come back a level and go, okay, right, so let's remind ourselves why we're here in front of these speakers in the first place or in these headphones and understand it, but also not let it rule you, not let the definitions rule you. For me, uh, loudness is what it pertains to any of the technology that we'll talk about today. It's modeling what John spoke about, the psychoacoustic phenomena. It's not accurately measuring it, it's modeling it such that we can use that to predict uh, how someone will perceive it. And what I'm mostly focused on is if you are trying to make audio content for someone else, whether it's music or a podcast or you're mixing a commercial for your local CBS affiliate and they give you a link to their website or some PDF document and it says, you must mix to this loudness level. I'd like to hopefully by the end of the hour that everyone can be able to discern that or make, make sense of what does that mean if I want to put up something up on Spotify and it says it needs to be at this loudness or I read somewhere on a forum that if I put something on YouTube, it's going to change the loudness. So uh, I'm hoping that that's what we can get out of today, besides just with the definitions. So that's good. So what all they, those three just said, basically. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, always the it's always the last one who's like, uh, what am I going to say? Yeah, so <laughs> we, we've not gone, not, you've, they've covered pretty much everything between yeah. them. But uh, yeah, as Charles said, um, by the end of this session, hopefully you'll have a much better idea of how to mix to a specific loudness, but that's that's not the point here. The point here is how to get it so that you can mix stuff that is good. Now, can I, uh, Alex, can I just throw in one one piece more? By all means, yes. So, I, I want to reassure everybody here, especially those who are just at the beginning of their career as mixing engineers or, or mastering engineers, all of us from the very beginning of our careers started with by comparing our work against others and noticing and one of the things you'd notice is either a loss of clarity or something different between what you've done and what your heroes have done and one of the aspects of that may be something you would describe as loudness loudness comes from many places there, there there's such a thing i think as getting good at the craft of mixing or mastering that will result in something that sounds impactful and maybe good and loud. But that's normal to want that. I think the thing that we're gonna hopefully do is break these ideas apart so we understand the sort of the measurements and the, the, the displays that we can use to help us navigate some of the challenges and the definitions. But don't feel like you shouldn't still strive for making something feel impactful. Okay, I mean, I just, I just sort of want to parse this a little bit more finely in that way. I think in a way we've already started explaining that really now, haven't we? While we're talking about that, one of the things that this gentleman just mentioned was how we compare. How many of you have, have looked at your music and, and, and listened to your music and compared it to something that you've heard on the radio? All right, pretty much all of you. So pretty much what we're doing when we're doing that is we're comparing something that is coming straight out of our DAW and our equipment to something that's mastered by a mastering engineer is measured properly and designed to be on that medium. So you're automatically putting yourself at a disadvantage by trying to compare yourself to that because you're literally it's, it's apples and oranges. You're not there yet. It's like it would be fairer if you could compare it to something that was just mixed and not sent to mastering. But when we compare to a master that was something that you're hearing on a CD or radio or even streaming, God help us, um, you're not comparing something that's fair because it's already prepared for that and yours isn't. Yeah. And I think one thing which is, you know, you said apples and oranges. I'd like to say it's more like apples and tangerines because when you hear it off of the radio especially, not only has it been uh, manipulated by some sort of dynamics or, or limiting, it's also being taken care of by another source. There's so many things where that audio can be changed in the stream. Uh, before mangoes. You actually, yeah, mangoes, even better. Yeah. I like that. I thought you were going to say apples and like a Mercedes. My audio <laughs> professor used to say apples and dogs. But can, can I just ask another question of the audience? Uh, Glenn asked about, you know, who's students and who's mastering engineers. Uh, just for our conversation so it's relevant, 
is most everyone, I'll give a few categories and we can raise hands, working in music or audio for video or podcasting or radio or something completely different. Yeah. Music, raise your hands. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, that was the guess. Go on. There, there could be Aud multiple hand raises. Audio for video post. Great. Uh, podcasts. Radio. Okay. That's helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank Very you. Very much so. So now that we've gone through a little bit of finding out what loudness is, there's many ways to exhibit that as far as metering is concerned, especially throughout history. There's been the VU meter, there's RMS metering, PPM metering, if those are any of you from overseas, might be using those a bit more than us here in the States. Peak meters are all over the place. Those all show level in various ways. But how does, what is that and how does it compare to loudness metering? What is loudness metering? So the, um, the main difference is how they, well, they all try and give you an indication of how loud something is relative to something else, what we've touched on already. Um, and all of these different meters try and um, give you a number that, that indicates how it's perceived. However, each one of those different metering types has drawbacks. Um, the, what is currently considered a loudness meter follows a particular standard, I won't go into all the details, but follows a particular standard that has been proven over recent years to be a pretty accurate measure of how loudness is perceived. Um, so it's done through uh, loads of tests, people actually sitting in a room listening to how loud something is compared to something else, and they say, yes, that's louder, no, this is quieter. Or whatever. And that came up with the current standard. Um, and that's the main difference between all of these old meters and the new wireless meter. So maybe um, how many of you, a show of hands, everybody's familiar with peak metering and what, and what its value, what its use is, right? It, it does have a certain value. It tells us something about our relationship to distortion in a fixed point universe. Um, RMS, actually, I, I don't want to undervalue the idea of RMS. RMS is a way of measuring level that does connect more directly with our perception and the way we evaluate the loudness of a sound in our environment. And this, before we had the modern versions of loudness metering, RMS was a pretty good way of measuring it. The relationship between peak and RMS is incredibly valuable to understand and use on a meter as an indication of the difference between the, the averaged or windowed signal and the peak signal. And before we start talking about the modern versions of this, I think it's really important to highlight that that relationship is still incredibly valuable. And if you use a meter, in fact, I think if you're not already using a meter in the context of your work that's showing you peak and RMS at the same time, you should start tomorrow. Um, because that relationship, I'll, I'll illustrate this by giving you a very simple example. If your snare drum's way too loud and your bass is way too quiet, then your peak to average level is probably going to be too great. And you're going to have problems later when you try to push level up because you need to get level up on the meter because you need the thing to sound louder coming out of your speakers. On the other hand, if your peak level is really quiet compared to your average level, then you're going to have a really quiet snare drum and nobody's going to dance that would be sad. So, um, so it, in a very basic way, this metering, it, you know, even the old school metering is incredibly valuable. The other thing I want to mention is that loudness weighted metering, which we're going to get into, I promise, is sometimes unhelpful because there's a, a relational aspect to it. And by that I mean it doesn't necessarily relate to an absolute value. If I'm aligning um, the output of my mix bus to a compressor, and I'm sending out 1K and 100 hertz and 10K, and I want to make sure the compressor is giving me the same amount of gain reduction at all across the spectrum, loudness metering is going to be a problem. Because, but now we're not so much talking about loudness, we're talking about level within a circuit, and relationships within that circuit. It's a technical measurement at that point. That's right. So I, I just want to point out there are ways in which peak and RMS are incredibly useful and valuable, and it's sometimes uh, sometimes they're the best way to go. Has anyone else besides me ruined a recording by mistaking what type of meter they were using, or is it just me? Okay, there's a few other people. So, obviously, these are all valuable uh, even today. 
especially with peak metering, we don't have, actually have anything going over zero, especially in the digital realm. Otherwise, you have instant distortion. But if we're getting into loudness metering itself, we're going to probably open up a loudness meter, and it's going to give us a lot of different terms. And one of the things which I'd like everybody to walk away with today is not to be like, oh my goodness, I have to learn every single one of these terms and the scientific definition thereof, but walk away with a sense of a few of the terms in English and why are they useful? You know, what is, what is, how are they useful to you, especially as music creatives, those in podcasting, audio for video, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to sort of see if we can create some easy to understand definitions for some of these terms. One of them is being K weighting, which is part of loudness metering. Can somebody, at least in a very simple sense, tell me what K weighting is? Would you like to do it or shall I? I go for that one. You? So um, basically, K weighting is just a way of weighting the uh, different frequencies that you hear so that they're all level according to the way you perceive them. So different frequencies are perceived at different levels. Um, and K weighting is applied before the loudness meter to make it so that the meter shows the same number for something that you perceive to be the same level. And this isn't something that you should ever really have to do yourself. The tool will do that for you yeah. built into it. it. Yeah, it does it. It's, it. it's handy to know what it means. So if someone mentions it, you can go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. But forget about it now. Here's, no, well, here's what you do at home, just to demonstrate this to yourself, is you set up a, an LUFS meter, and you play a 1K tone, and then you play a 50 hertz tone, and you play them at the same level in the dBFS scale, and look at what the meter shows you. And it's going to show you that the level of the 50 hertz tone, did I say 50 before? You just the said 50, 50 hertz tone is going to sound quieter, because it sounds quieter. That's, and that is the influence of the K weighting shape, or filter. So we have LKFS and LUFS, which we see on both of those on several different meters. Not trying to go into the history thereof. In a modern day meter, some people think they're the same, some people think they're different, but really, what is LKFS or LUFS? It, it's the same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Historically, there was a very small difference. They're, they're, they're the same thing now, so don't worry. Just pick one. It's uh, the. Um, it's a terminology that different companies came up with, basically, and ended up being in everybody's products. Yeah. You can think of it as like a, um, it's like a dB scale. It has the same relative difference. So a 3 dB change is, or 3 LU change is the same. It's, it's about doubling in volume or halving in volume, depending on which way you're going. But it's just the unit that we use in measurement. But if you're Thomas Lund or Florian Kammerer, you can then turn LUFS into pithy titles like LUFS is all you need. You can't pronounce LKFS, can you? Oh, it's too many consonants. I wouldn't put either of them on a t-shirt. <laughs> True story, I did make a tweet last week that said Luffs for the whole family. So I'm guilty of that too. I, I do have a badge that says all you need is Luffs. Sorry. There you go. By the way, we have dad jokes included in this <laughs> just for everybody. Just give you a warning. No charge. <laughs> so I think we'll get back to Luffs uh, fairly shortly because it's going to associate to one of the other terms. But one of the things which I think is very interesting is somebody, you know, you open up this meter and it has all these different terms on it. And one of the other ones, uh, which sometimes isn't always expressed in the meter the, the way you think it might, but is LU. And I'm just going to say, what? LU? Lou? What is Lou doing? It's a loudness unit. And much like a dB or a decibel, it's relative to something else. And if we look just above LU, there's LUFS related to full scale. And so that's a loudness unit related to the full scale of, of what your um, technical equipment or your equipment can technically reproduce or represent. And then LU is just the sort of free-floating relational measurement between two different uh, effectively levels. but. It's using the scale that we talked about, that Charles talked about, that is influenced by a bunch of user studies where people said, OK, that seemed louder than the other one. That one seemed louder than the other one. And then they ran all the statistics on that and came up with, yep, this is a good corresponding measurement between two different levels. K 
can I be the rebel in the group for a second? Please, no, please do. No, All right. No, no, don't do I'm, I'm asking these <laughs> questions like I don't know, so you need to help me out here. So one of the things that uh, uh, that I think is worth pointing out here is all of us represent companies that have products that really do help you. And it's not a case of one is better than the other. It's not like that because all of it comes down to, in my view, colors in a palette for an artist. You choose what's good for you. Doesn't mean it's gonna be the same for everybody else. One of the things that we focus on in my world is not so much anything past the first four definitions that are on that list, but what they actually do for you as fast as humanly possible so that you don't have to spend your time knowing that everything that these gentlemen around me know. Because all of it, in my view, from where I come from, which is a music background and a music side, is let's focus on what we need to do to get the metering and the levels right, but 90% of that time needs to be sent, spent on the product, not on that little small part. So we were discussing this beforehand. You were late. So, um, that, well, makes, that makes me the rebel. It totally does. Um, one of the things we were discussing is it's like sometimes, especially when you're, you're, you're a beginning in this industry, but also sometimes we get hiccuped in it when we're pros as well, you can suddenly realize that you've spent three hours working on something that realistically shouldn't have taken more than 10 minutes to work something out. And then you have to remind yourself where your creative level is. Let so, me, can I, can I para try to paraphrase what you're saying? Absolutely. In Australian, please. All right. So, what well, I'd like to say, don't make me do that. Somebody's going to get offended. So, we're talking about visualizations and helpful aids to help you understand something about the audio. Visualizations are amazing and wonderful and can help us learn, but you lead with your ears and you verify with your eyes. Is that is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Okay. So, now that we've gotten that out of the way. So, quick story on that one. Um, uh, I shared a bit of it earlier on. I did a, a study once with two human beings. You are all human beings, correct? Yes, I hear you think. Okay, so one of them mixed up a one minute piece of music on an SSL 4K with the hardware durometers to keep an eye on their levels and make sure everything was okay. Another person mixed exactly the same piece of music in a DAW with an SSL channel strip and a plug-in of the durometer. You have no idea how different those pieces of music came out. One person was mixing with their eyes and a completely different part of their brain. The other one was mixing with their ears and relying just on the meters as a record. It's a very, very easy trap for you to get into when you start thinking about the subject that we're talking about. I'm going to say you're wrong. I love just, that. Just for fun. And I'll, in the follow, you're not actually wrong, but I will say and. So as a mastering engineer, after making 6,000 records, I begin to notice a correlation between what's happening on my visualizations and what I'm hearing. And using that information and that, that I've accumulated over time, I can begin to predict what I'm going to hear to some extent. I can't look at a meter and tell you what genre I'm working in, right? But I can look at something that's not moving very much or very fast and say, there's probably no drum there or the drums are too quiet, just for example. So as a mastering engineer, when I start to think in terms of genres, I have noticed an association between level on my meter and how much headroom I have and certain genres, or certain, you know, if it's a ballad versus an up-tempo track, I can start to predict something about what I ultimately will need to be seeing that will correlate to what I'm gonna output. So the visualization is not without value, and the more you can work to understand what you're seeing and connect it to what you're hearing, the better you'll be able to make use of these tools. So I agree. So if, I, uh, if I'm taking it from what you're saying, these relationships that we're going to be seeing on uh, a couple examples of these meters of your average level and, of course, peak level and so on and so forth, like you alluded to before, peak to RMS, it's got some values to it. In the loudness meter itself, there's something else that alludes to that. And if I'm not mistaken, that's LRA. Is that correct? And so what is LRA? So LRA is the loudness range. Now, it's a bit of a 
a weird bone, a bit of a misnomer. So it's it's put together. I think it's, was it EBU put it together? Yeah, I, I think it was defined by the EBU. Yeah, um, and it it's used sometimes in broadcast. I don't think it's really suitable for this audience. It's it's not a great. It's been proven to be a bit rubbish. Well, well wait a minute. How, how many of you were at the session yesterday? So Bob Ludwig did allude to LRA, or loudness range, when he was talking about a couple of examples. Uh, and he was using it to illustrate a point where he had actually increased the level of something and the loudness range, or the difference between loud and quiet, had increased slightly. And that was interesting. It's not, it's not a completely useless measurement, but it's not very useful to us when we're in the seat doing our work because it's a longer term measurement. It is, it's, a, it's, it's quite an unstable volume. So if you make small changes, you can make quite a large change to the loudness range it, without it having any perceived improvement in the audio. Uh, quite, there's, um, there's another AES paper that, that describes peak to loudness yeah. ratio. Yes. Which is the difference between the integrated value, which is the LPFS or LUF FS reading, and the maximum true peak value you've got in there. So that's the loudest your audio is. And I think for in music especially, that's a much better guide of the kind of how dynamic your audio is. So why don't we why don't we dive into the definitions of what actually is useful? I actually yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say because I'm looking at this audience and going. Okay, question for this, this real quick. Is it fair to say that loudness range is synonymous with what I'm sure everyone else has probably heard much more often, dynamic range? No. no. Well, I mean, boy, that's a, it, it's a great question, but I think you, you open up a can of worms. Um, the, 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 we play fast and loose with this phrase dynamic range. Dynamic range can mean the difference between noise and distortion in a technical system. We can talk about musical dynamics. Right, the difference between the chorus and the verse, or the intro, or the first chorus and the second chorus. But, but now uh, some of this becomes somewhat subjective. And so so which, program, which so. of those two examples is LRA more suitable for? The second, for sure. Yep. So now on um, these meters, I'm just sort of curious. How many people here really, truly get the sense of integrated loudness, short term and momentary, and how they help you in music? I see a few hesitant hands here. So I'd like to dive into a little bit more of what these three values are, because I think they're the ones that really are, they can be quite telling and very useful for you in different ways. So I'd just like to attack these integrated. Go for it, somebody. Not my Charles, area. Let's, Char oh, I think Charles is going to do a great job <laughs> of this. So the integrated program loudness is basically an accumulation of a bunch of loudness measurements across the entire time that you've measured. So typically, if you are um, making a song, you would have an integrated loudness measurement that represents you know, the entirety um, of the accumulated measurements across the entire piece, or the entire commercial, or the entire podcast. Yes, basically the average, the average loudness of the whole thing. So should we, should we give this a little context, or do you want to go through the definitions let's go, first? Let's go through the other two definitions and then how they could be useful for the music creatives and so on and so right. forth. Okay. So with momentary, okay, and short term, I'm confused here. So sometimes I think they might be the same, but they're not. Well, but they're closely related. They are. Um, so momentary is a K-weighted filter uh, com um, combined with an RMS measurement. So it's like your VU meter is in your console uh, with a weighted output. That is momentary. Yeah, so it's a relatively short kind of average. 400, like 400, 400 milliseconds. Yeah. So it's, it moves very, very quickly, but not quite as, as fast as like a peak meter would. Yeah. And short term is how much longer? Three. Two, Three seconds. 2,600 yeah. milliseconds longer. Oh, we have math here. This is too hard. <laughs> it's three seconds. It's, three it's seconds. a three-second measurement. And the reason that the three-second measurement is meaningful is it does a better job of portraying for us the perceived loudness across a musical phrase, Okay, something that's got a longer term to it. 400 milliseconds isn't really long enough to capture uh, a, a, the, the level of a sustained note or the envelope of the signal that's complex. But typically, when you look at momentary and short term, unless there's something really unusual about your program, they're very, very close, within a couple of dB of each other. Who was it earlier on who was talking about uh, sword swoosh? So would that, would that have been momentary or short term that would have been useful there? 
I think we agreed beforehand it was it's momentary. momentary. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, you, the, the short term with yeah, a switch is just so the, the, like half a second. Isn't the it? background yeah. on that question is I had a customer come to me one time and they want to do a bunch of bas batch processing of different sound effects for a video game they were working on. And so they had 2,000 sword swipe sounds used in the game and they wanted to make sure that they were all loudness normalized such that the game engine could then do its you know, randomization and dynamics. What they were used to coming from music or a few other things is using the integrated program loudness where it would just measure the entirety of the piece. But these pieces were, in some cases, maybe 500 milliseconds, maybe even shorter. And so the batch processing uh, using that algorithm was not useful. And you had to coach them to use a different measurement when it's too short. So it's kind of a, a pathological case uh, for our, our audience here that's dealing mostly with music, but definitely a real world situation depending on what industry you're in. So without going into the details of the other two or three aspects of loudness metering, if I'm mixing a song, let's say I'm doing a hip hop album, and I want to be Pic using... Picture that everyone now looks doing hip hop. By, work, by the way, I work in classical, so that's like totally outside of my realm. We have to make that meme. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm mixing a hip hop album, tell me why would I... Which values do I actually want to look at and why? And, or actually, better, I think, is when do I want to be using the loudness meter? All right, so interesting. So I'm going to take a quick step back to make sure that we sort of take this, take this apart all at once. Um, so Charles, I think, was defining the integrated um, level, which is a measurement across a whole track. While you're working, integrated loudness is meaningless, at least when you're working on music. It really doesn't have any meaning in a real-time uh, real context. At the end of the day, you can measure your track and find out what the integrated level is, and we'll get into talking about what the implications are for what that measurement is compared to what Spotify or Tidal or whatever is going to put out into the world. But that's a separate issue, OK? The, the real concern that you have is, how close am I to distortion? How much headroom do I have? Is there something that is, um, well, I, I love what uh, Gamel Guru did yesterday when he demonstrated this idea of if you leave enough headroom in your audio, you will have enough uh, room for the kick drum or the bass or whatever is supposed to be impactful to take a running start and drive the driver forward. And if you push level up higher and higher, there's less and less difference between quiet and loud for there to be this big excursion to get the kick drum to happen. So what does that mean? It means that if you use a target level for your mixes that leaves plenty of headroom, there will be enough room for all of the impact to be in your mix that you want in your mix. Now exactly what value that should be is something that you have to experiment with, and it does vary with genre. Um, if, you, if you're going to use a limiter in your mixing, then maybe your mileage will vary. But traditionally, if you aim to have your mixes sit at about minus 16. 16 what? We should make them guess. Thank you for asking. Yes. Uh, who, so let's, yeah, let's, let's go for it. So how many people know minus 16 luffs? That's right. What do you mean luffs? Integrated, short term, momentary? He says integrated. How many people agree with him? How many people disagree with him? How many people are not sure? How many people haven't raised their hand? <laughs> How many people can't hear? I'm sorry, but you're wrong. It's not integrated. Remember, integrated is the measure of the whole song after you're done. Is this file louder on average than that file? Right. So you could, you could use minus 16 dBFS. OK, that could be a calibration point. Or you could use minus 16 momentary. LUFS. Okay, what that would give you is a little more insight into, sorry about that, into the, um, the how much low end is present in the overall result. Okay, let me, let me tell you, sort of break that down a little bit more. Remember, our hearing is less sensitive 
to very low frequencies than to mid-range frequencies, right? So if you have the same level on a meter and you have a lot of almost subsonic energy, okay, you're going to get a quieter mix because you will not hear it as clearly and your LUFS meter will show you that, okay? Which can lead you to begin to diagnose something about how come my, mas my mix or my master isn't loud enough you know, it seems like I've got plenty of level here, but my LUFS value is low. Maybe I should investigate, maybe I'll put my headphones on or take a look at a spectrogram and see if I have big spikes at 20 hertz, something along those lines. So that's a way in which LUFS metering might give you an advantage. Um, How'd I do? You did great. Okay. You're my hero. Today. Today. So, so, so we can get into more of how to use these meters and what do they look like and, and so on and so forth. I just want to finish out with the other things that happen on a lot of these meters that you folks have produced or utilized and so on and so forth. So often I see this little light go on and off depending on what I'm playing and how loud and soft it is. And like Eureka, I found it, that kind of no, light? No, I'm actually this little thing that says gate and it goes on and off, on and off, on and off. And also there's this value of true peak. So the gate is easy. It's, you know, you go to the uh, amusement park and it says you must be this tall to ride this ride. That's what the gate is. It says it needs to be this loud before I'm even going to bother measuring it. The steel lead. I like if that. It's, thank you. Uh, if it's too quiet, uh, the meter is just going to ignore that because otherwise, let's say if you're doing a live recording and there is, um, we'll go with classical for Alex here. If they need to reset the stage between two different movements to move some chairs around to add in a third violin, and the, the audience is very polite and quiet during that change, well, you're recording a lot of really, really quiet stuff. And if your meter is measuring the loudness during that portion and you're going to use that as part of your total integrated loudness for the entire file, it's going to bring down your overall level because there's a decent percentage that's pretty quiet. Anyway, the, the way I often, now I'm going to answer my own question. But what, what I find with that little, little gate when it turns on so the meter stops working is I don't have the air conditioning in the room making my, my meter activate and telling me something that's possibly quite inaccurate. Or how many of you have actually, like, work in a studio environment, you see all lots of stuff going on on your peak meter? How many of you are... How many of you actually know what meter you're using and have a favorite meter? And do you understand why it's your favorite meter? It's a, a it's, 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 it's a question that's worth asking because um, one of the things, as a, a, in total contradi contradiction to what I said earlier on about focus on the sound first and making sure that you actually have something that sounds good, it does help if you actually have, a, you've made the decision, okay, this is the meter I am using, but I understand why. You know, you're, that's, that's such a good point. I think you develop a relationship with a meter, with the color scheme, with the ballistics, with the size of it, and all of that. And I think it's, it becomes a point of reference. I, I'm really glad that you said that. Um, yeah. Let me go back to this idea of gate. Well, I, just just because we have to move on here a little bit, oh, good. I, okay. I'd like to yeah, at least do it. let's actually look at some of these th different meters and oh, wait, it's my a true peak. There we go. So we'll start with waves. I mean, there's various meters, and a lot of you guys can purchase different ones, and there's actually a lot of free ones available out there. But the visualization of it, actually, it. Uh, certain ones can, you can be gravitated to, towards. Right, and, and one of the things that we've always done is we've been very loud with our plugins. Um, probably why I fit so well in this company. Um, this plugin was actually designed specifically for post production initially. The reason why it's ended up leaning more towards music, though, is because of something I said earlier on, which is one of the aims that I always have when I'm talking to especially people who are coming up is let's focus on the premise and what you're actually doing and make sure it sounds good and then go, okay, right, let's make sure that your levels are okay. Let's not focus on the levels and try and be creative underneath it. So, and that's why, you know, we also added in a true peak limiter there, uh, a soft true peak limiter to try and help nudge people down without actually making them go back to the start to start again. Um, 
It's definitely, but what, what John said is perfectly true. It's like, it's all colors in a palette. It's like, we choose a meter sometimes specifically because of the way it looks or a plugin of any kind, right? Sometimes it's like, yo, man, that plugin's dope. It's my best American accent. Um, and, and it's like, it's because of the way it looks and it's because of our creative side of our brain going, okay, I'm comfortable with that. It's decoration. Um, we try and, this one is useful because it has long term, it has short term, and then it also gives you a, a, a log and a readout. So isotope, had, yeah. isotope one looks lovely. Oh, thank you so much. So it's, it's very similar. It gives you uh, the same information arranged slightly differently. Um, if you take a look at the image on the left, yeah, can, actually, is it, it's not showing. So there is a peak and average display on the left side right now. It's showing you a, a 5.1 configuration. It can show you stereo. It can show you integrated level accumulated over time. It can show you short term. It can show you momentary. Uh, and it also shows you history. So if you're mixing for post, that may be more interesting to you because you can see the moments during your mix where your level has either persistently or consistently exceeded your target or fallen below. Um, and, and you know, the, what's, what I love about the Waves plugin and something that we've emulated um, in our new release is the ability to resize. Um, you can take the Waves plugin, if there's a lot, if it's too noisy a display and you just want to see a couple of numbers, you can shut everything off and size it and put it in a corner of your window and just see that. And then when the time comes that you want to look at any of this other information, you can do that. Are you about the Did you have a question? I don't know if you said the definition of true peak. No, we, we haven't covered it yet. Thank you for asking. So true peak, I'll handle that just real quickly before we wrap up. Um, it's basically a measurement of what might happen when you get back to the analog world. So you have in the digital world, you have sample, sample, sample. And what may happen in actual analog hardware whether it gets to your amplifier or to your speakers or something like that, the actual signal is going to oscillate uh, or travel. It's not going to be the stair step when it gets back to the analog world. It's going to travel. And sometimes it can actually travel beyond what the actual physical sample level is. If we're further along, you could see that in audition just by zooming in and it shows you an interpolation that's similar, but uh, not, not exactly the same. So it's basically, it, it is a better measurement of what your peak might be, and it does. It's basically it does a little bit more math to help you along to prevent. Other there there so are basically only two times that true peak matters. Um, one is when you're so close to zero dBFS that the conversion to analog might push you into distortion, and the other time is when you're ca making calculations in DSP, especially with limiters, yep. where we're dealing with very short-term peaks. And, and, and in that case, true peak matters. The rest of the time, don't worry about it. Peak is peak. So. Obviously, there's a variety of meters here. That's for you folks to decide which meters work best for your produ particular production. But at the end of the day, I'd like you all to be able to know that you're walking away with a little bit of slice of what loudness metering does, and that you can create a mix that's very meaningful. It could be at one value. You don't want to necessarily look at it versus another. but it allows you a, some measurements to say if you can deliver your content to another provider, which they're going to give you a target level to hopefully uh, distribute the content on. But we're not telling you that you can't squash it. You can. Yeah. Can I give you two takeaways? Yeah, we did two more. Uh, quickly. Um, one is, um, first of all, when you print your audio to a WAV file, make sure you have a little margin at the top, half a dB or a dB is even better if it's going to go out to an MP3 or an AAC. So that's takeaway number one. If you don't remember anything else, that allows for this sort of peak mistracking that happens at the top of the dynamic range. Thing number two, if you want to understand a little bit more about this, download a bunch of your favorite music and observe what values you see, either in terms of integrated or in terms of the movement of the meter, and begin to notice when the music sounds good at the loudest section, for instance, what does it look like? Because that's the way you'll train your ears and, and the visual correlation to what you're hearing that will help you understand something about how to make your work better. I know one of the things, um, and I'm interrupting Alex before he could stop me, 
one of the things one of the things that all of these companies do around me, all of my peers, is we all have amazing f uh, information to help you get a quick start on how to use these products. But not so much on how to use these products, but why and when. And that's one of the important things. Don't automatically put something on because somebody said you should. Understand why you're using this. This is important stuff, but you've got to have the creation there first. So don't let it overpower the creation. Yeah, and as a, as a closing statement, this is not to hinder your creation, it is to help your creation. And always keep that in mind. Can I also say, so I, I've made a bunch of videos that are free online under the Are You Listening brand, and uh, there are more coming out uh, about this very topic. So please enjoy them. Hopefully there's some real takeaways about the work and not about one product versus another. <laughs>